We will now have our final message today by Mr. Matt Steele entitled, Jesus Lifted Up in the Wilderness. Hello again. So, you've probably already heard me tell you this, maybe more times than I realize, but um, there's a new Christian TV show, and it's called The Chosen. And I think, uh, I think Stephen, you and I were talking about it just a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe. Has anybody watched it? One, two, three, four, five. More of you need to watch it. And maybe, uh, maybe the message today might, uh, might encourage you to do so. It is a multi-episode, multi-season, hopefully, TV show. And uh, it is a show on the ministry of Jesus. Now, you know, Hollywood has uh, tried to do this in the past, right, with all the various movies and so on. Uh, I don't know if they've done a TV show on it. I do remember when I was, uh, oh, I think a young teenager, there was a, a show that I still like to watch today called Peter and Paul, and it was Anthony Hopkins was in that. It was, it was a, a reasonably well done show. But this particular one is actually making um, a lot of waves because of how good it is and how non-Hollywood it is. Because you imagine Hollywood getting hold of anything biblical today? I mean, what was the last thing that they did? Was it uh, the giants, the, the rock giants that were helping Noah in the flood? Um, and then there was a small child who was representing God in some version of Moses. And all the Israelites fought the Egyptians. So uh, clearly nobody in Hollywood, not that we ever needed to know this, but nobody in Hollywood actually reads the Bible. So, But this particular show, it's interesting because it's crowdfunded. It's actually been funded by Christians, by believers of all kinds of different denominations of one kind or another for the purposes of preaching the gospel. Now, you know, when we read the gospel accounts, when we read uh, the gospel accounts, it's, it doesn't always read like you would expect a TV show to flow, right? Because if it did, it would be very short and probably not very satisfying as sitting down and watching a television show. So, of course, they're adding some narrative and context and they're trying to, to complement the scriptures. And what I've noticed is they're doing a really good job and not taking away from the scriptures. They're focusing to those moments where you actually hear the scriptures. They're not trying to reinterpret reinterpret anything. So as I say, I've, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of this show. I've watched probably every episode about five or six times. And so is my poor family. But we all love it. And in spite of maybe one or two things that you say, eh, no, I don't think that's right. In spite of that, it's a lot better than watching any of the shows that we have in the world today, isn't it? I mean, just think about all the content that is pumped into the, every home in the United States and indeed in the world. And this is far better than that. My favorite episode is episode seven. Now, if you go and watch episode seven, you might think it's because that's when my namesake is called. But that's not really the reason that it's my favorite episode. It's my favorite episode because of two scenes. One at the beginning, and then one probably about three quarters of the way through. Two powerful scenes, and they're connected. And they do this so very well. And they allow just the story of the scriptures to paint the picture. It's Firstly, the, uh, the part of the, the first scene is um, with Moses and Joshua in the wilderness. And you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with the ministry? Well, we'll see. And then the other scene is the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. I want to show you those scenes today. Now, they might not be as powerful as if you've watched the entire episode. 
maybe watched all the episodes leading up to it, because you kind of get an idea and a flavor for how they developed the characters in the storyline. But I think you might gain something useful from these. Now, in the first scene, <laughs> I will say that they use a cross. And you'll see why, but we can set that aside. Because the most important thing is what they hang on this cross. Because in the Bible, it's actually just the word ensign. This means a banner, it could be a pole, something you hold up in the air to lift something else up. And it is, of course, the scene where there is the bronze serpent lifted in the wilderness. So Brian's going to play that scene. Joshua, how many more in the night? Some 300, sir. Where will you bury them? Men are trying to take a trench, but the ground is hard and rocky. With respect, Moses, my concern is not for the dead, but for the dying. Hundreds fall by the day, and for every serpent we kill, another ten appear. Maybe we should leave the bodies here, in this tent. At the rate people are dying, there would not be enough room, even if we stacked them to the top. Then we'll have to leave and find some place else. We're not leaving anytime soon. Too many people are sick and cannot walk. After today, the only Hebrews too sick to walk will be those who choose to remain so. Is there medicine in that bronze? You told the people that you would ask God to forgive their rebellion. To heal their serpent wounds. I did. Then why are you hiding in a tent? It wasn't my idea, Joshua. That is a pagan symbol. You did not ask him if you were sure. Maybe you misunderstood him. I've learned to do what he says without questioning. You remember what happened at Meribah. Just to be sure, we could send a messenger to Ezeon Gip or beg for aid. That pole. Hand me that pole. The people will say it is a cruel joke. Let them say that. Help me understand. None of this makes any sense. How do you explain the Red Sea? The man in the coil? The pillar of fire? Joshua, any Israelite who looks upon this bronze serpent and believes in the power of Adonai will be healed. It's an act of faith. Not reason. A little dark. <laughs> it's not that dark in, uh, on the regular television, but hopefully you can get the point of what was going on there. Moses in the wilderness, in a tent, forging a bronze serpent. And I've never really thought about that. You know, you just read in the scripture, it's a, God says, do this, and so he does that, and, but there was actually, somebody had to do this work. And have you ever asked that question yourself? This is a pagan symbol. What was God doing? Why was he having him put a pagan symbol up in the air? Well, let's just turn to the passage. In Numbers chapter 21, and verse 1, it says, The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, 
heard that Israel was coming on the road uh, to Arthur. And they fought against Israel and took some of them prisoner. And so Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. And they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So that that name of the place was called Hormah. So God hears the prayers of Israel. They trusted in him. They obeyed him. They succeeded. They won the battle. They had victory. This is the context of what happens next. Because then they start to grumble and complain. It says in verse 4, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor to the way of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. Think about that. I mean, is this shocking? It should be shocking. Because the way was hard. Because they had to travel an extra distance, longer, further, <clears throat> to avoid Edom. And they were tired of the journey. And they complained that God was going to just let them die in the wilderness. Not the first and not the last time that they wanted to go back to Egypt. After everything he had done for them. After the plagues. After uh, bringing them through that baptism. Parting the waters and bringing them safely through the Red Sea. The leading of God through the wilderness, through the pillar of fire and the cloud. They could just look up right there. They could see that God was with them. Were they not looking up? Or were they looking up and still not caring because he wasn't doing things the way that they expected him to do things or wanted him to do things? They weren't alone. He wasn't leaving them alone. He actually came and helped them, right? We just read that. He came and helped them win battles when an enemy came against them. The journey so long reminds me of Steve's last couple of sermon titles. Are we there yet? So long and worrisome. But unless we judge them too harshly, how often do we do the same? That we get weary along the way, downhearted and fearful. And maybe think that we're alone. And forget that God has fought for us. You know, thinking about this the other day in this COVID situation, and it's still here. I mean, who thought, what, a Passover time that we would still be talking about this and still be dealing with this? And it's become this noise, hasn't it? This the swelling background noise that is disturbing and unsettling. And we can forget God in the middle of it. How long is this going to happen? How long is this journey? How long till we get to the other side of this? We forget sometimes that Jesus has taken us by the hand, each and every one of us personally, and said, follow me. And he didn't let go. All we have to do is look up. As the psalmist tells us in Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. 
The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. That's a promise. It's a promise to us. A promise of God's protection on his people. On those that he has called. Those that he has chosen. He will protect us so much that he protects us from moonlight. Did you notice that? He shades us even from the moonlight, which is helpful for Reg, because you know, any source of light is disturbing to Reg. But that's how much protection he has for us. He preserves us when we go out and when we come in. When we go out in a mask and when we come back in without the mask or whatever the situation is, he preserves us and is with us just have to lift up our heads, don't we? And remember this. But we forget this truth, just like Israel did. God sends us testing, though, doesn't he, when we forget this truth. He sends us trials sometimes when we forget this truth. In Israel, in this situation that we just read about, in the, the, the video that we've just seen, This was a new level of forgetfulness. This was a new level of rejection of God. Because there's some very important things that they rejected. And you might say, well, they didn't know how important some of these symbols were. But God could not allow their response to go unanswered. Turning back to Numbers chapter 21 and verse 5. In their complaints, we have some serious condemnation. He says, And the people spoke against God and Moses. And they said, Why have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. That was manna, right? That was the manna from heaven. The bread from heaven. The bread that they didn't have to work for. They didn't have to plant. They didn't have to cultivate. They didn't have to, you know, break the ground and put the seed in the ground. They didn't have to pray for rain and worry about the the crops and the harvest. They didn't even have to harvest it, barely. Just pick it up off the ground. They didn't have to thresh it. They just ground it up right there and made bread. Who would love for their food to show up in the backyard right now? Right? Right? I don't have to go to Costco and Walmart and I don't have to wear a mask and I don't have to feel like I'm, you know, going to a surgery whenever I get out of my car. We would love that. Then does manna. But they just didn't appreciate it. And God couldn't allow this disrespect. He could not allow them to treat the bread of heaven this way. Because it wasn't just to feed these ungrateful people. It was a symbol, wasn't it? It was one of the points in which we can learn about the salvation that God is bringing for us. He could not allow the bread of heaven to be loathed or rejected this way. It was not worthless. It did have incredible value. So, he had to respond. And it's amazing, isn't it? Just as their fathers rejected the bread from heaven, so the children at the time when Jesus was walking on the earth rejected the bread from heaven. Same attitudes, same heart. It's the heart of men. When Jesus told them in John chapter 6 that he was the real manna from heaven. Same kind of rejection in many ways. They did not understand or accept the tremendous gift that God was giving them. The true bread of heaven for the whole earth. So, what else could he do but bring judgment? To bring a trial. To bring correction. And for what purpose? To bring them back to him. To bring them back into a right way of thinking. And bring them out of sin and back into God's grace. 
In verse 6 it says, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And as many of the people of Israel died, therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have broken, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpent from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And it's interesting. The Lord didn't just say, okay, I'll take, I'll take the serpents away. He used this situation powerfully. So God says to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole that it shall be to everyone who is bitten. When he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And this, you know, some things that are ju jump out obviously to us here. God waits for them to repent. Firstly, he sends this this judgment, this punishment on them to bring them back to repentance, and he waits for that. It doesn't say exactly how long. But many were killed. Many. And they understood it was from their sin. He gave them a corrective measure. Do we have moments like that? Maybe we're in a moment like that right now. Maybe the world is in a moment like that right now. Trying to get our attention. Maybe God is trying to get our attention. You have to wonder about this COVID-19 situation, don't you? I mean, we've, we've thought about it from a prophetic standpoint. We've wondered if this is the start of things that we know will come on the earth. And we certainly know by reading of scripture that this is child's play by comparison to what will come on the earth. But still, we wonder, is this, the, is this the beginning? But maybe it's just God trying to get the world's attention. Now, I'm not saying he brought it about, but he knows about it, doesn't he? Of course he knows about it. Job 34, verses 21 and 22. For the eyes, for his eyes, are on the ways of man. He sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. God knows everything that's going on on this earth. From secret conspiracies, from wicked men, from our everyday mistakes, to the corruption that we see in the world and the plans of the enemy for this world. God sees it all. He's aware of this situation. Did he send it? I don't know. I don't know if he sent it. But I know he hasn't stopped it. Because if he wanted it stopped, it would be done. But then again, have we repented? Have we even in the slightest come back to him? Imagine what would happen if the whole world, or, or maybe not the whole world, but maybe the so-called Christian nations of the world would get on their knees and pray Jesus, help us. Pray the Father to, to take this, this curse, this injury, this virus, whatever it may be, away from us. Would he hear? I think he would. But we're not willing. You know, if you do a, a simple web search, from medical images uh, for imagery and logos of hospitals and medical providers and so on. You get images like, like this. I think Brian has it. It's ubiquitous, isn't it? It's the world over. It's <laughs> the bronze serpent lifted up in the wilderness. Do you know whose logo this is? Anybody? The World Health 
organization. Yes, which is part of the UN. You think they even know where this image comes from? <laughs> Doubtful. Doubtful. Because the first place that they run to is all of the things that man can do, right? And I guess Israel was probably doing that too. You know, we saw in that video how many, how many snakes got beat to death. But not enough, right? They couldn't kill enough. And it, it almost sounds like, um, what's that thing? The hydra snake thing, cut one head off, you know, and more grow back. Maybe that's the origin of that story. Yeah. WHO, I don't think, is going to put out an appeal for everybody to pray for God to send healing. You know, doctors and nurses have a role. We know that. We can even look that in scripture. We can, we can find scriptures that talk about, you know, treating wounds and, and putting ointment on them. Medication. You know, the, the, the plants and things that God has provided for us, uh, of, what, of which many of our medical treatments are, are derived from. And we can, we can understand there's a place for that kind of care. But clearly, we have no answer for this virus. I said that months ago, and we still don't. And all the various reports about the, the vaccines that are coming and so on have very doubtful supporting evidence that they work. So we have fiery serpents running around the world, in a sense. And the world is refusing to look to God for healing. I wish it would. We could get back to normal tomorrow. Right? Because if, if our version of looking at the bronze serpent were to happen today, everyone that is in the hospital today will go home today if they could look on that bronze serpent and be healed. And that's what Israel was told to do. They were told to look on this bronze serpent, to look on the image. And, and this is the really important part, I think, at least to what I learned in this. Because I always struggled. Why, why look at a pagan image? <laughs> right? I mean, the Egyptians have a serpent on one of their crowns, and Joseph will tell you all about it. It's a pagan image. Why were they told to look on the bronze serpent? Why make a bronze serpent for them to be healed? It was an image of the thing that was killing them. And that's an important piece for us to remember. But when we move forward and we look at what Jesus did for us, God was asking the people to look upon this image, the image that was killing them. And so that takes us forward to this seemingly disconnected conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. It's recorded in John chapter 3. But before we read the scripture, I want to show you this next scene. It's the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And unfortunately, it's probably going to be a little dark again. So, you're just going to have to watch it for yourself. Um, but it is continuing in this, this connection, in this storyline. It's about ten minutes long, so get comfortable, and I'll be back. Welcome, Nicodemus. Don't be alarmed. He's waiting for you. I asked the owner of this house for more lanterns. But he said they would draw attention. Yes, I... Imagine they would. The human eye is drawn to light. When 
Can't help it. It just happens. There are many things we are drawn to without our thinking or our ability to explain why. Thank you for agreeing to meet. Thank you for trying to help Mary when you did. It was no help. You were meant to be there. Me? So I could fail miserably at an exorcism in the Red Quarter? <laughs> if you had not been there that day, would you be on this roof tonight? I don't know where to start. I have so many questions. I... Shall we sit first? Oh, yes. slums. Hmm. Many wandering preachers have succeeded in gathering crowds with their rhetoric and fiery tone. I've heard a few of them over the years myself. So you know the type. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard anyone tell a paralytic to get up and walk, much less it actually happened. So what is your conclusion? I believe you are not acting alone. No one can do these signs you do without having God in him. Only someone who has come from God. And how is that belief going over in the synagogue? <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we are here at this hour. What else? What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean like a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? <sighs> I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, and she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear its sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize his effect. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that. Do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They wanted to return to Egypt, and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then? They were bitten by serpents, 
and they were dying. But, but God made a way for them to be healed. Moses lifted the bronze serpent in the desert, and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our people are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. And from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish. But have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about... Sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? Shh. When I met Lilith, Mary, that day, I told my wife and my students I said, she was beyond human aid. Only God could have healed her. And then I saw her healed. And here you are. The healer. I, my whole life, I have Join me and my students. In two days' time, we leave Capernaum. Come see the kingdom I am bringing into this world. But I... I, I can't. You have a position in the Sanhedrin. You have family. You are getting advanced in years. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But the invitation is still open. To what exactly? To lead a nomadic life? To, to give up who I am? It's true. There is a lot you would give up. But what you would gain is far greater and more lasting. Is this another one of your born-again mysteries? <laughs> uh, maybe. I know mysteries aren't easy for a scholar. Think about it. Hmm? Take your time. On the morning of the fifth day, we leave and we'll meet by the well in the southern quarter at dawn. Is this... Is the kingdom of God really coming? What does your heart tell you? My heart is swollen with fear and wonder. You can tell me nothing except that I am standing on holy ground. <laughs> holy roof, I mean. Come with us, Nicodemus. You don't have to do that. What are you doing? Kiss the sun. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Blessed are all who take refuge in him.
pretty interesting, isn't it? Pretty powerful scene. Now, you know, obviously they've added to, to the narrative there. Uh, we don't have any of the, the last portion of that. But I don't mind telling you, I tear up every time I see that. Because we all come to that place at some point, don't we? We all come to that place, whether we're sitting in a chair, whether we're on our knees, when we finally accept and realize that Jesus is our Savior. And we could say the same thing as Nicodemus. That we are standing, or sitting, or kneeling on holy ground. Or a holy roof. Very powerful scene. But what we do know about Nicodemus is he was there at the end. He was there after Jesus' body was taken down. And he supplied the spices and oils. Enough for a king. I think he knew exactly who he was. And there's really no doubt in my mind. I mean, could you imagine being Nicodemus after having that conversation with Jesus and then seeing him lifted up on the stake on Calvary? He knew exactly who he was. Powerful, powerful scene. So let's just turn to John chapter 3 and, and verse 1. We'll go through just the passage here. I'm running short of time, so I'll, I'll try and uh, wrap this up. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from, come from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of things in this passage, and there's certainly a lot of things that we have come to know and we respond to uh, maybe larger Christianity when they use the term born again. And we're like, but you, you missed the point. Because the single biggest point about this passage, or this part of the passage, is that when we are born of the Spirit, we can go wherever we want, whenever we want. And no one can see us or stop us. So the question about whether or not we're born again currently is pretty quickly answered, isn't it? Because right now, wherever I go, somebody can see me. Wherever you go, somebody can see you. And in today's surveillance state, everybody can see you. What else? What else is in here? Well, let's, let's skip back down to verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus said to him, Are you a teacher in Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Never, they had never heard this before. I mean, I like that, that line where it's Andrew, and I, I can't remember um, who the other is. John? Andrew and John, they're sitting on the steps out of sight, and they're listening and taking notes. <laughs> and he's like, have you ever heard this before? No, shut up. <laughs> Let me try to get this down. This was amazing. And he says, 
As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, think about this for a minute. How amazing God is. Because we have Israel way back here, what, 1,500 years previous, sinning, grumbling, and cursing the manna that God gave to them, the bread of heaven. And God sends this judgment. But then in the process of that, the resolution, the restoration, the way that they can be healed plays right into the plan that he has already in place. So, <laughs> question. What if they hadn't grumbled? Would have God sent the snakes and then he wouldn't have than the bronze serpent held in the wilderness? Now, you could probably say, well, it's Israel. They're going to complain about something at some point, right? But still, God was able to take that and use that and project it forward to what was going to happen for our actual salvation. So, we come to this one other point that I think was brought out by Joshua when he said, this is pagan. How can we look on something that's pagan? Well, it (laughs) kind of struck me. I've never really thought of it this way before. But do you realize that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was pagan? Do you realize that? In God's law, it is Wrong, it is sinful. You shall not sacrifice human beings. And yet, that's what happened. He was murdered. He was hung on a tree until he was dead and was our sacrifice. And you know, I I get it, and there's a lot of controversy sometimes about the word cross and crucifixion and so on. And I understand where everybody's coming from. But what's the most important thing? What was the most important thing in Israel in the wilderness? What's the most important thing for us now? It's not what it was hung on. It was what it was. You weren't looking at the pole. You were looking at the bronze serpent. Right? And so in many ways, all of these crosses all over the place, they are kind of pointless. Because we are to look to Jesus. He was the one that we should look to. Just like the Israelites were told to look at that bronze serpent. And then that raised another question to me. Well then why? You know we have, we have Israel looking at this bronze serpent. That pagan image. Why were they looking at it? Because it was an image of what was killing them. Right? We looked at that earlier. So when we look at Jesus, he became the image of what was killing us. Sin. He became literally the image. His broken body, cut, beaten, bludgeoned. Literally the thing that man has done to man through all of his history. And what we've done to God through all of our history. Rejected him, pushed him away, kept him at arm's length, even though he was trying to save us. And then, of course, as we know, Jesus took on himself the sin of the world. And so when we look at him, we know that all of our sin is on him. Everything that hurts us, everything that we do to hurt others. Jesus said in verse 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation, 
that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And that is so important for us to remember as we try and walk this Christian walk and walk in this Christian life is that we can only do the truth in God. We can only do that truth. We can only walk in that truth. We can only share that truth. It says right here that have been done in God. It's only with him. I really wish the world could see what we've seen. I really wish the world could look upon Jesus and believe in faith that he could heal us from any sickness. From COVID-19, from all of the civil unrest, from all of the brokenness in our society, and the disconnect between brothers and sisters. I wish the world could see that. I wish they could see the kingdom coming. But we can see the kingdom coming, aren't we? And so we should give them that truth whenever we can. And when we do, when we share that truth, we're bringing light. We're bringing the truth and the light that God sent his only son. That he was lifted up as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness. That Jesus, our Savior. I mean, who's ever heard of this? There is no religion. There is no God that man has ever devised. That has even come close to what the real God has done for us. Man couldn't even imagine this. When we look upon God, upon God's only son. Lifted up in the wilderness. And I think we'll agree with what we just watched. That you and I, and hopefully those that, that hear our words and hear the truth that we bring to them, are recognized as they stand before Jesus. That they too can stand on holy ground with him.